Sohrab Golagli's specialization is spinal surgery, and several cases have been awaiting his visit. Among them is Teng Navi, a 13-year-old girl suffering from scoliosis, or curvature of the spine. Three spines. Three new spines. Three new spines. Where are they? From, yeah. Um, Three new spines? Yeah, right. Okay, come on in. Yeah, so this is um, this is a you know a 13 year old girl with scoliosis. So looks like she's got a little hemi vertebra here. Um, measuring the curve with a technique called the Cobb method, and then she also has this really bad curve like this. Okay. 13 year old female. Assisting in the operation will be Dr. Ucheng Niep, the most senior of the center's Cambodian surgeons. When she goes to school, usually she was teased by she's teased by her friend about her spine that's abnormal, it's curved. So that now she wants to have her spine straight like the other kid. That's why she wanted me to have the operation. So Nip is uh, more or less my right hand. I would say he's one of the best surgeons I've ever met in my life. Not just Cambodia ever. Uh, a guy who can come up, look at the new problem, is willing to take it on, learns how to deal with it, and can think straight within the parameters of that problem. But Dr. Niep wasn't always going to be a doctor. He'd wanted to be an engineer, but the Khmer Rouge changed all that. What made you want to be a doctor? Um, I say at him, uh, it was uh, my father's death during the Khmer Rouge. I had wanted to be an engineer, but uh, then I had switched to be a medical doctor. Just outside Phnom Penh, Cambodia's notorious killing fields, the site where thousands of victims of the Khmer Rouge lost their lives. Across Cambodia, it's estimated the genocide killed two million people. Anyone considered part of the educated elite was especially at risk, including the country's doctors. I think before the Khmer Rouge, we have uh, several hundred doctors, and then when the Khmer Rouge came to power, then uh, all the doctors, all the officers, all everybody had to leave the town to work, to go to work on the rice field, and so on. And there, some uh, or most of them get killed, or were starved to death, something like that. Got a lot of torture. Then, uh, after the Khmer Rouge, I think only uh, very few doctors come back to life. The one I saw you yesterday with, and I said you could do the osteochondromas. Still trying to rebuild the medical system, Cambodia remains heavily dependent on foreign help. But Dr. Ngyep knows that one day they must become self-reliant. I, I fully agree with the idea that the Cam Cambodian doctor must not rely too much on the foreign doctors because this is Cambodian, this is our country, so we should build our country by ourselves. So if you figure out that it's going to With be that foreign help comes something of a culture clash, especially in the form of Dr. Jim Golagli. Why don't you just say to me, okay, we thought about that, it ain't going to work. Right. Hailing from an old-school right. medical tradition, his abrasive style is sometimes at odds with the younger generation and well. often at odds with the softly spoken ways of the Cambodians. Yeah, we need to find out what's wrong with that kid. Right, right, right. What's the matter with him? Do you know? A broken leg. A broken leg? Well, it doesn't wait for Dr. Nia. Bring him in now and let me have a look at the x-ray. Has he got an x-ray? I, you know, I look at my dad and I have an incredible amount of admiration for him. Broken leg? I think that there are few people that could accomplish this, and I think that uh, there are undeniable personality traits that some people would call dictatorial, um, some people would call bulldozer-like, that allow someone to come to a country like this and build a hospital up to the point where it does 4,000 operations a year. So, babe, cut it out. I did this whole operation without an IV. I don't want an IV oh, now. Just oh, hemogram. Why can't you stick it in the groin? <laughs> I mean, you know, 
Then it's just awful. I mean, you know, you can basically take some blood right here. Uh -huh. No right. problem, I, I, right? Okay. I, you know, whether I'm an explosive Irishman or whatever. <laughs> um, no, if, if I say things nice and quietly, they don't always react. They don't always quite understand, and they don't understand it's a request or an order or anything like that. Also, there's a generational thing. You know, as medicine has evolved, it used to be very common for people in the first world to have personalities like my dad. There used to be a lot more screaming and shouting. There used to be a lot more thrown instruments in the operating room. It used to be acceptable to kind of lose your temper. Um, and now, of course, that's not the case anymore. I mean, we live in an environment where we're really good at what we do. We, you know, we basically are following a flight plan. The expectation is, is that we're calm and you know, polite to everybody. And if not, we end up probably in some sexual harassment committee somewhere <laughs> explaining our behavior to somebody else. Me, when I started to know him, it became to me very strange, very shy, very scream. <laughs> but now I used to him. I know that he's a kind man. Fingers out. You take this finger off now. You don't need these fingers. You don't need these fingers now. I, I... <laughs> In Cambodia, because of the language problem, okay. they're right. paying attention more to the tone than to what the words are. Very good, Soklang. Very good. Good. Got a name on and everything? Yeah. So I've got to change the tone depending on what I want done and if I want something done and I just say it nice and calmly can we transfer this patient over there and let me know when it's done it's it's just a conversation they're not paying very much attention but if I say now transfer that patient over there and call me when it's finished then it's far more likely to get done <laughs> and then I'll be less frustrated <laughs> Recurve seen from the front of the spot. So, so up, uh, is um, quiet <laughs> and very friendly. He will not shy. He more patient. But Tim is <laughs> this is a bit of difference between the <laughs> the father and the son. <laughs> it's with the son that Dr. Nyep will be working as Teng Navi is prepared for her back operation. So the way this will work is Nyep will do it. I, I do one half and then Nyep does the other half and in the process get the operation done. So we'll give her a general anesthetic, she'll lie um, face down on the operating room table, it will be a large incision and then we're using older generation spinal instrumentation here. We have kind of a hodgepodge of different forms of instrumentation that, um, that have been available to us that we've scavenged over the years from various different hospitals and donations. And so we'll hook that up with two um, stainless steel instrumentation rods and place something that we call sublaminar wires underneath a portion of the spine and try to correct the spine as much as possible given the limits of the instrumentation that we have and also the fact that this isn't really the most ideal setting in the world to do really really aggressive correction and you know if this was done back home in the United States we'd have a neurologist monitoring spinal cord function and the, the thing that we worry the most about is someone who has a cosmetic deformity of the spine that we know it's going to get worse over many years has a spinal operation and wakes up paraplegic. So this is an example of how rare this case would be in the United States. Over a 25 year period, I think there are maybe 15 or 20 cases. I don't know that it's any more prevalent than it is in the United States. It's just that this is the only institution in the entire country of 12 million people that's at least gonna you know, look at these.